So the first topic for uh, today is uh, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a Bodhisattva. So this actually to figure out this one usually takes us our whole lives, right? The whole process, you know, of being a Bodhisattva, actually almost eternity. <laughs> so does anyone know what a Bodhisattva is? Like a saint. Like a saint? Somebody, okay. Somebody that achieved enlightenment. Somebody that achieved enlightenment. Okay. But have not yet entered Parinirvana. Continue to live and work for the salvation of the all sentient beings. That's, that's good. That's good. That's actually very, very precise. Somebody will, uh, somebody would like to, uh, somebody in some would like to share something. A bodhisattva is someone who doesn't just wish for enlightenment for themselves. They wish to come back and cause others to realize their Buddhahood in kind of a non-selfish way. They sacrifice that. They don't go, okay, I'm cool. I'm good. I got everything going. Screw the other people. That's not what a bodhisattva is. Bodhisattva is everybody how many other people can i take along the way that's very good very good Chrissy. so bodhisattva uh the word bodhisattva bodhi comes from uh enlightenment right and uh sattva means uh being so bodhisattva is an enlightened being an enlightened being so and uh uh yeah it, <clears throat> something that that we mentioned are like saints right that's that's important but there is a uh key difference between uh uh saint and in a bodhisattva especially in uh this from the buddhist perspective right because a saint uh the way that we look at it in christianity is somebody uh, somebody that exists so outside yourself right but as you know we have many bodhisattvas oh, as the as christian as catholics do with saints we have many saints but uh bodhisattvas we have so many bodhisattvas especially if we read uh buddhist sutras we have you know every time you get to the first page you have to get go through all these disciples and then you get to the list of saravakas and if you didn't fall asleep on that first page, then you can keep reading the sutra, right? So there's this so many bodhisattvas, but there there are some that are more um, uh, which am I call uh, more famous than others, more popular. Like anyone knows the name of a bodhisattva? Manushri. Manushri. Manimaitya. Maitreya. Which one? Uh, Kanon. Okay. Kanon, yeah. Avalokitesvara. Very good. Oh, there's one, Kwan uh, Yin, right? Kwan Yin, that's, a, uh, that's also known as a Kanon and Avalokitesvara. Anyone else? Nichiren Shonin was a Bodhisattva. Nichiren Shonin is a Bodhisattva, that's right. Well, there's one that allows people to, uh, the one that listens a lot that's fine yeah oh yeah oh, okay. yeah i remember one. <laughs> that's, very... that's a, actually like it's superman of a bodhisattva so everybody likes that one right yeah, so nice. bodhisattvas actually represent you know the bodhisattvas that we have in the sutras and that we have uh in temples actually uh, they represent aspects of enlightenment right while the buddha represents complete enlightenment right bodhisattvas represent certain aspects of enlightenment right so avalokiteshvara represents 
uh, in the quality of compassion, right? Manchushri represents, uh, somebody knows what Manchushri is? Manchushri is a wisdom, right? He has a sword and with that sword, he calls through ignorance, right? So that sword actually, probably if somebody give us that sword, we will kill somebody, right? But Manchushri uses it to destroy ignorance. Mm. So that's what it represents. We'll, which other one? Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra is always represented in a, in a big elephant. Uh, Manchushri usually is on top of a lion. So all these bodhisattvas represent different aspects of enlightenment. So Buddhists usually when we uh, do devotional practice towards a bodhisattva, it's not actually, it, from the outside, it looks like we're asking something from that bodhisattva, right? But actually what we're doing is trying to awaken that aspect of enlightenment within our lives. The, so when we pray to Avalokiteshvara, we're actually praying to awaken the aspect of compassion in our life. When we pray to Manchushri, we're actually praying to wake up wisdom within our lives. So it's, all, it's always in Buddhism, for, for the outsiders, it looks like, wow, look at all these Buddhists just praying, right? As <laughs> looking for someone else to fix their problems. But it's actually, we're looking for wisdom, compassion, and all these virtues of, uh, of enlightenment that exist within us. We, we identify with the Bodhisattva, and then we work on that aspect in our lives. So uh, now we have certain bodhisattvas. Uh, we have different levels, right? So bodhisattvas actually have 52 levels of enlightenment. But when they get to the number, to the ultimate level, they stop. What do they do that? Because they want to share what they found so far. That's right they don't want to achieve a complete nirvana. They want to be able to stay, you know, with suffering, suffering beings. This is a definition about what bodhisattvas do in the Lotus Sutra that I love. They say, bodhisattvas do the work of the Buddha. We do the work, you know, why I say we do? Because this is the thing. According to the Lotus Sutra, each one of us is potentially a Bodhisattva. So of these 52 levels of uh, Bodhisattvas, right? When they get to the ultimate level, they say, no, I'm not gonna go further. That's why sometimes in Tibetan Buddhism or Chinese Buddhism, you talk about Avalokiteshvara and they call him, they call, him call her, uh, Buddha Avalokiteshvara or Buddha Kuan Yin. They don't say Bodhisattva. It's because it's almost a Buddha or ultimate level of Bodhisattva. Christy, you want to say something? No? Oh, okay. I saw you raising your hand, so I was wondering. So ultimate level of Bodhisattva, right? Almost a Buddha, but holding back just to help other sentient beings. So the Lotus Sutra is very special because um, remember that we were talking about that we have this potentiality, right? We, when we uh, praise a Bodhisattva, when we pray to a Bodhisattva, when we focus in a Bodhisattva, we're trying to awaken something, some aspect of enlightenment within our lives. So how, why is that we can do that? We're going to uh, an aspect of enlightenment within our lives. It's because we possess the state of our bodhisattva within us. So potentially, you know, all of us are bodhisattvas inside. Remember, Sensei was talking yesterday and he did, did this really cool figure, right? Like, okay, if this is your mind, what, 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 where is anger? How much does it, you know, 
covers in, in your mind or your life. And, you know, Bodhisattva, you can do the same thing with the aspect of Bodhisattva. So you grow it and grow it and grow it and grow it. You know, this we're talking about enlightenment. So we have this potentiality of Bodhisattvas. So now I would like to talk a little bit about the Lotus Sutra, right? Because uh, something that is very important about Nietzsche and Buddhism is that everybody is either a fan of Avalokitesvara or Manchushu or Maitreya. But something very particularly happened in the Lotus Sutra. So, uh, and many Bodhisattva appear in many sutras. Like you can find Avalokitesvara in almost every sutra, or Samantavadra appears in many sutras. But something special happened. Uh, when uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was preaching the Lotus Sutra, you know, Taho Buddha, uh, many treasures Buddha came with his stupa to testify that what Shakyamuni Buddha was preaching was true. So at that moment, imagine this huge stupa, you know, appears in, in the heaven and everybody's like, what's going on? So, it, well, of course, if you don't know much about Buddhism, you're like, Kantoku, that's impossible. How many how stupas are going to start floating in, <laughs> in the sky, right? But it's, this is actually no, literally. Imagine this is the way that Shakyamuni Buddha decided to express his enlightenment through the Lotus Sutra. So we have this stupa, you know, floating, and everybody wants to see the Buddha that is inside. So first, uh, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha has to purify this world. He creates a pure land in this world, purifies the world. So this world as ugly, torn, feel of war and everything has a potential inside to be a pure land, a indestructible pure land. It's like, to put it on Christian terms, it will be like <laughs> heaven on earth. So this land in which we live has the potential to be uh, heaven. We have to actualize it. But the problem is who's gonna do that, right? So when Shakyamuni Buddha uh, opens the stoop, everybody sees the Buddha. Uh, he, everybody is like, wow, this is so wonderful. We want to see the Buddha up close. So every, Shakyamuni Buddha takes everybody and makes it, you know, levitate on the air, on the air and uh, they're all floating in the air and can see, you know, the two Buddhas sitting together on the stupa. Now, you know, all are so convinced that the Lotus Sutra is so wonderful, right? Because there's something special about, you know, the Lotus Sutra. So when does Taho, every time you do Gongyo in your home altar, every time you chant Namu Myo Horen Kyo, actually the stupa of treasures of Taho Buddha appears in the place where you're practicing. So every time we're practicing here in the temple, you know, spiritually, the Taho Buddha appears with his stupa. And this place becomes a sacred place. Same thing with your house. So anywhere where the Lotus Sutra is preached becomes a pure land. So all the Bodhisattvas want to uh, share this wonderful Dharma with everybody. And they ask Shakyamuni Buddha to entrust them the Lotus Sutra, but uh, they put a caveat, just a little caveat. They say, we're gonna go spread this Sutra, but we're gonna go to other worlds. Why is that? because this world is too difficult. Which world? The Saka world, this one in which we live. So no Manshrushi, no Avalokitesvara, no Samantavadra, none of them has uh, the strength to share the Lotus Sutra or to spread the Lotus Sutra here in this world, to do the work of the Buddha in this contaminated age. So in that moment, uh, the Buddha refuses to them to entrust them the propagation of the Sutra, of the Dharma. So out of nowhere, there are the splits open 
and all these bodhisattvas have merged from the heaven within the earth. And they're so beautiful. They look almost like Buddhas. Even uh, more beautiful than regular bodhisattvas. And all of them have their disciples coming with them. And, you know, later on the sutra, these are the bodhisattvas to which uh, Shakyamuni Buddha entrusts a lot of sutra to preach them. Now, if you look in all the entire canon of Buddha's, Buddha's teaching, the, there's nothing else said about these amazing bodhisattvas, the bodhisattvas that emerge from the earth. Do you know why? Huh? Louder. There's no wrong answer. They're future bodhisattvas, maybe. They're future bodhisattvas, right. Yeah. Are they like angels? Uh, you, you're putting it too far away from yourself. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay, so remember that we were talking about um, uh, there's a potential, right? There's a bodhisattva sleeping within ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Within each one of us. So these bodhisattvas represent that potential, potential between uh, within each one of us and you know the reason why they don't appear and actually Nietzsche and Shonin talks about this on his writings you know the reason why they don't appear again in any other sutra is because their stories their achievements have not been written yet because they're now beginning to appear so it's talking about actually each one of us, you know, that from a long time, you know, we have had this bodhisattva of the earth inside of us, waiting to awaken, to do the work of the Buddha, because that's the number one thing for a bodhisattva, do the work of the Buddha when the Buddha is not present. So if you read the Lotus Sutra, you know, you hear about the 16 Ramaneras in one chapter, and that's actually chapter seven, you know, the 16 Ramaneras, what they did, what did they do while the, the Buddha was on uh, meditation? <laughs> they preached the, the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Dharma. Mm -hmm. And what did the uh, other uh, uh, bodhisattvas that appear on chapter one when the Buddha wasn't, uh, wasn't there after he entered a nirvana? They preached the Lotus Sutra. So the bodhisattvas are always, when the Buddha is not present, bodhisattvas do the work of the Buddha. They do the function of the Buddha. So as bodhisattvas of the earth, you know, potentially, we have two things to do, right? First, we have to uh, be able to believe, and this takes a um, certain level of confidence on yourself, that you have to work on this and develop it, that you are a bodhisattva of the air, actualize it in your life. But as we know, uh, action, right, uh, speak more than anything else. Like when we were discussing yesterday, we were talking, I mentioned about action, right? Action is the ultimate thing. Because we, we can talk theory, you know, for hours and hours and hours, right? But it's only theory. We're not going to change the world just with theory. We have to implement action, right? So through action, we can actualize our true nature as bodhisattvas that emerge from the earth. And this bodhisattva has, the, if you read the Lotus Sutra, when on uh, chapter emerging from the earth, they say that these bodhisattvas are the oldest bodhisattvas, more powerful than any other bodhisattva, more powerful than Avalokitesvara, more powerful than Samantabhadra, Maitreya, or Manshushri. They're the oldest bodhisattvas around. 
They have been learning from the Buddha, from the infinite past, 500 uh, dust particle kalpa ago. That's a ridiculous amount of time. <laughs> so these bodhisattvas are the most powerful on, on, on the universe. And there are no others that each one of you. And we have this mission to do the work of the Buddha when we're not here. And uh, this takes, uh, there's something that I don't know if you have ever, oh, before I continue. Anybody has a question? Question? Go, go ahead, Gerard. Oh, oh. Yes, I have a question. <laughs> Good morning. Bonjour tout le monde. <laughs> Bonjour. Uh, I have a question about uh, about the Bodhisattva, about the chapter in the Little Sutra. They were they are talking about Bodhisattva. For example, Fukuo who canon. Yes, a chapter uh, uh, chapter twenty. 20, yes, in chapter uh, 25, yes. I want to know, in, uh, uh, and there is some chapter contracted, contracted, you know, in the, in the, in the Gongyo book. I want to know in which, uh, which situation we shot this chapter, these chapters. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. Nichiren Shonin, if we if we read uh, Nichiren Shonin's writings, there's a few chapters that are very special uh, for bodhisattvas, but it depends. You're talking about propagation? Excuse me. Uh, I don't know really what for. <laughs> Well, there, there are different chapters that we use for different things, right? Uh, chapter 20 is to close up. Chapter 20, Bodhisattva Fukyo, Never Despising Bodhisattva, is uh, very important because actually uh, Nichiren and Shonin took the example of uh, Bodhisattva Never Despising, which is a previous life of Shakyamuni Buddha, right? So Bodhisattva Never Despising exemplifies the way that Nietzsche and Shonin propagated the Dharma, right? So if you look at the life of Nietzsche and Shonin, it's very similar, very similar. Like, and uh, there's also similar time because timing is everything in Buddhism. You know, we need to know the capacity of people that we're preaching to or that we're teaching to. So if you look at Bodhisattva Nara Despice, and he was a uh, born in a time in which the Buddha Dharma was disappearing, later age of the generation, right? And same thing with Nietzsche and Shonin, later age of the generation. So uh, Bodhisattva never despising, he would go and he didn't have the sutra, right? The only thing that he knew that was that everybody had Buddha nature inside. So he would go and, and vow, to everybody and tell them, you know, uh, I respect you deeply because you will be able to walk the path of the Bodhisattva and you will achieve unsurpassed enlightenment. And some people listen to it and they were okay, but some people, especially arrogant people, you know, will throw stones at him. So he will go away and he will from far, two blocks away, you know, scream to them. I respect you deeply because you're gonna achieve enlightenment. <laughs> and you know, and he will bow. And people will throw them still stones at him. So, you know, he was relentless, fearless on the way. So Nietzsche and Shonin was kind of the same. So the never despising bodhisattva is usually uh use uh as a encouragement for practitioners, uh, bodhisattva doing propagating the Dharma. They want to teach the Dharma to others. Same thing with chapter 10 and 14. 
So Nietzsche and Shonin, if you check the road Gosho, when he talks about chapters that teach him how to preach the Dharma, how to propagate the Dharma, he always mentions chapter 10, chapter 14, and chapter 20. Those three chapters are key. And of course, uh, emerging from the earth chapter. Those, those four ones are extremely excuse, important. Sorry, sorry. Excuse me, Kantoko. Can you repeat the chapter? The chapter, please? sorry. The numbers of the chapter. Ten. Ten. Yes. yes. Fourteen. Fourteen, yes. Ten, fourteen. Emerging from the earth. And can they on? No. 15. Yeah. 15 is emerging from the earth and 20. And and what? 20. 20. 20. Okay, gracias. Merci, gracias. <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, everybody thinks, uh, you know, if you take chapter 10 and chapter 20, they're completely diametrically different from chapter 14, right? They say, and Nietzsche and Shonen used to say they're like water and fire. That's what Nietzsche and Shonen when, used to say when he compared them, completely different. But uh, Nietzsche and Shonen, uh, say that, you know, we need to know when to use each. So sometimes we're going to need to use a teaching from chapter 14. Sometimes we're going to have to use 10 and 20. Any other question? Let's see the time, 9.31. Oh, Gerard, question, go ahead. I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't talk uh, every every time with you. Uh, and I, I have another question. But go ahead. Say, yes, please. Uh, for, uh, uh, there is Bodhisattva from the Hinayana, yes? And Bodhisattva uh, from the hills, the Jinu Bodhisattva. Uh -huh. I think there is a difference, but I don't know. Can you explain the difference between uh, Bodhisattva from Hinayana and Bodhisattva from the Lotus Sutra in the chapter of Jinu Bodhisattva? Okay. Merci. Okay. So I don't like to call them Bodhisattva Hinayana because that's very strong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. But, but Nietzsche and Shonen uses that word in, uh, in the writings. So I, remember when I was talking about, you know, Bodhisattvas of the earth being the oldest, the most powerful one. You know, I just mentioned this a little bit ago. So uh, there, that's what Gerard is referring to. So the bodhisattvas that emerge from the earth compared to the bodhisattvas that are at the beginning of the sutra, you know, uh, the bodhisattvas at the beginning of the sutra are like Hinayana, a bodhisattva, like provisional bodhisattva, while bodhisattva of the earth, you know, why, why is the difference? You know, because according to Buddhist thought, um, maybe I have to explain this. This is important. You know, Buddhist thought is that all lives, right? All lives go through the cycle of birth, aging, getting ill and sick, declining, dying, we die. Then we born again. That we call it rebirth, no reincarnation, because there's a slight difference difference between reincarnation and rebirth. Reincarnation, right? The soul goes from one body to another body. But for Buddhists, actually, there's no, we have something see, close to soul, but it's not exactly the same. 
because people usually identify the, their soul as you know their selves you know and buddha told us that actually the self is not actually what we think you know it's not my memories it's not my personality it's not so the spirit that goes from one uh existence to the next one it's not exactly the same as before like most of us we don't have recollections from our previous lives right maybe some little trace goes from one existence to the other you may have a deja vu a dream here and there but you don't have like the full picture you know you don't know exactly where you who you were where you live what you were doing you know so very few people have any recollection small recollection at all of that that's because that that we identify ourselves with life uh with spirit you know uh that doesn't go from one existence to the other what goes from one existence to the next but sometimes in japan the, we in both japanese Buddhism we call spirit you know it's karmic energy from going from one uh manifestation to another one so the same all composite things you know go through this cycle of you know death and birth and rebirth same thing happens with the universe right so we have the kalpa of formation then the kalpa of maintenance where everything is fine then we have the kalpa of destruction and then you know the universe ceases to exist until we get another bing bang and universe appears again formation again so everything goes through this and because everything goes through this then the buddha dharma the teaching of the buddha goes through the same cycle it doesn't mean that the dharma disappears the dharma is always the same it's always there but you know the tools that we have you know the sangha the sutras everything you know goes through the cycle of you know formation flourishing decline and destruction so for the according to buddhism we're already on the issue of decline of the dharma so from the point of view of buddhism you know uh and according to the lotus sutra the reason why the buddha doesn't entrust this hinayana bodhisattvas with the dharma is because they're not strong enough so actually the buddha thought that you 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 and you guys are more powerful than avalokiteshvara you have more strength even though most buddhists will go pray to avalokiteshvara for compassion so the key message of that is the amazing power that you have within your life your incredible power inside of you but you have to awaken that power how do we do that chanting and study and practice that's right but you say kantoko you know i i don't know if i can do that through chanting and this is this is something that a lot of people don't don't understand um you know about chanting why namu myo horenge kyo is so special why why is the most powerful larani over there you know nichiren and shonin told us that you only need to chant namu myo horenge kyo you don't need to chant nothing else how can something so simple be so powerful because maybe you're constantly reminding yourself to dedicate yourself to you know to some faith that's important that's important it's like hammering good when you have you ever tried to open a coconut Mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> it's a lot of fun a lot of hard work especially yeah. if you don't have the right tools oh yeah actually picture. one day i'm gonna bring a coconut and i'm gonna show you <laughs> there's a technique how to break a coconut you know with one strike wow. you just need to put it on the right position 
solar is all about the position but anyway if you don't know about this little trick and you don't have the right tools you know you need to hammer 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 and even though at the beginning it looks almost impossible that was quite a mission i went <laughs> almost at the beginning it looks quite eventually you break through right so namo myo horenge kyo works like that it's, uh, there's something important also about namo myo horenge kyo when we every time we do a Buddhist practice, what do we do at the end? We bow. We bow, yeah. But before we bow to to close it, we hey, dedicate sorry. our merits, right? Yes. We dedicate our merits. So every time we do Buddhist practice, we dedicate our merits to everybody else. There's something very special on regards to namo myo horenge kyo and merit. And as a, you know, when Shakyamuni Buddha give Namo Myo Horenge Kyo, the, the five characters of the Lotus Sutra to the practitioners, you know, that's the dedication of merits from the Buddha to us. So I, there's a part of the Sutra where it says, all the wisdom, all the secrets of the Tathagata are contained in this sutra. You know, that means that all the merits that the Buddha accumulated through infinite uh, lifetimes after lifetime, dedicating his life as a Bodhisattva to achieve enlightenment, he's passing it to us. This is kind of, uh, what was the word that we were using yesterday with Sensei, the covenant? Yeah, that's right, covenant. This is the actual covenant between us and the Buddha. We always, when we finish practice, dedicate our merits to all sentient beings. Buddha does the same with us. He dedicated our merit, he's married to us, he passed it on to us. So we can have the strength and the capability to become uh, these amazing bodhisattvas in this life so you're not doing it alone at all you're not doing it alone buddha is helping you to do it through namu myo horen yekyo so this is a very important this is why namu myo horen yekyo is so powerful and what is more cool is that this is not something that a super being is giving you this is another actually another human being giving it to you sharing it with you because we're all interconnected, right? We intervene. That was what what teach Nan Han always though the he was a great teacher. That you know he always talked about intervening. We intervene with the Buddha at the same time. Any questions? Comments? But isn't uh, Chichnahan from another, a different school than the nation? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a Vietnamese, a school. Vietnamese Chan, yeah. Vietnamese Chan, Sen Chan, Chan school. He was a really cool teacher. Not my cup of tea, a little slow for me. <laughs> I, I read a lot of books from him. I, I like the teaching, but the way that he gives it is like I'm um, falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, we're good so far. Yes, sir. You guys are ready to go to sleep? No, no, okay. <laughs> so, another <laughs> thing that I wanted to share from you, and this is also from Lotus Sutra, is about fearlessness. So, if you have an electronic version of the Lotus Sutra, I would like you to search for the word fearlessness. On the Lotus Sutra, that's probably fast, faster than going than going old school and reading the whole sutra and, and highlighting words fearless says that I would have to have done when I was a teenager for for a, for a, some projects. But nowadays we have computers, so it's it's easier, right? So you can go to the sutra, and I want you to look about fearlessness. And usually, when the word fearlessness appears in the sutra, it is talking about the fearlessness of the Buddha or the fearlessness of the Bodhisattvas. And when he's talking about the fearlessness of the Bodhisattva, he usually says about the fearlessness of preaching the Dharma. 
So fearlessness sounds like a big deal, but I want you to think about shyness. shyness. Don't be shy to share the Dharma with other people. Yeah, so actually the ultimate, ultimate uh, act of compassion, you know, mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if the other person knows or not, wants to practice Buddhism or not, because actually none of us knows, is able to see the connection that the other person has with the Dharma. We cannot see it. So if we're shy, or if we have fear, right, we may, that person may have a connection and we may not give, give him or give her the causes and condition to be able to make that cause flourish, you know. Then the most important thing about, you know, we want everybody to achieve enlightenment, you know, because uh, if you, since I was teaching yesterday about uh, the great uh, concentration and insight from uh, Master Dien Tai, and if you read the, the concentra great concentration and insight, Makashikan, you know, the first thing that you see on that book after a very long commentary from one of his disciples uh, <laughs> uh, is, uh, uh, you know, a chapter on bodhicitta. Anybody knows what bodhicitta is? Kale, do you remember what bodhicitta is? I'm trying to remember bodhicitta. Inspiring to be a Buddha. The, inspire, the inspiration, aspiration to enlightenment, right? Right. But it's not any aspiration for enlightenment. So chitta means a mind. It's kind of a state of mind, right? But it's a, there's two kinds of bodhicitta. This is actually, uh, according to Tibetan tradition, uh, uh, bodhicitta, okay, you have a... Uh, uh, Small body cheetah and big body cheetah, right? So the small body cheetah is like, yes, I want to achieve enlightenment. Or actually, actualized body cheetah is when you want the enlightenment for everybody. And that's a very important one. That's the one that we aspire. So before, so Master Zientai used to say, before you start practicing med uh, meditation, you have to awaken the, uh, the mind the enlightened mind of compassion that you want everybody to be able to achieve the alignment together with you. Because that's the only way that we're going to actualize this world in which it is really a pure land. You know, we can try a hundred thousand um, different ways, right, to change this world. And it won't work because human beings, we have three poisons which are greed, hatred, and the last one, ignorance, ignorance. that's <clears throat> right. So no matter what you, you give a person everything he wants and who will mess it up. So you can give everybody all the money they need, all the medicine they need, and they will still accomplish to mess it up because we don't have wisdom, right? So first we have to get people to have wisdom. That doesn't mean that we see somebody suffering and we're not going to help them, you know. But we're talking about helps people in a deeper spiritual level. Because uh, if you give me all the money that I would like to have, I will probably be uh, doing cocaine on South Beach and partying all weekend. Yeah, that's probably what I will do with all the money. But that's not going to be good for me, right? That's not good for me, and uh, it's gonna kill myself. I probably I'm gonna overdose myself. Then I'm gonna sooner or later I'm gonna run out of money, and I'm gonna want to keep up the same lifestyle, right? Probably once you get a very addicted, you know, you start doing very stupid things. So probably I will uh, steal or kill somebody or do something very very wrong. My children will be suffering. You know, look at the mess that his father is. So even if you give me all the money that I would like to have, that's not gonna help. So the only real way in which we human beings can really truly live happy lives is when we happiness comes from the inside. 
when we look into the inside, that's through spiritual practice. That's why Buddhism is important. So if you want somebody to become truly happy, to be, have a wonderful life and to become enlightened, then share the Dharma with them. So that's, that's what it's about, you know? And uh, about that phrase that I want you to, is that word that I want to, to look in, uh, in the search of fearlessness, you know? Uh, the Buddha always says, you know, these Bodhisattvas will be able to preach the Dharma fearless, with fearlessness. They will be fearless in front of multitudes. There will be fearlessness. So overcoming fear, shyness, it's a very, very important in order for us to be able to um, accomplish uh, or work as a Bodhisattva. And uh, there's a phrase that I love from the Sutra that says, uh, the Buddha is fearless in the threefold world, which means uh, in this world in which we live, the Buddha fears nothing. 